Greetings, mortals. It is I, Remortis, bringing you yet another guide to Baldur's Gate 3. This time, a continuation of the Necronomicon, Chapter 4. Everything to know about the Circle of Spores Druid. We'll be going over how to play the Spore Druid in Act 1, 2, and 3. We'll go over your general strategies, how they might vary, and also your different flexible options you have available to you. We'll be going over all of their skills available to them and how to really get the best mileage out of all of their features. They are a very versatile class. They can wear medium armor and thus can be quite tanky in their own right. They can deal really solid damage with their symbiotic entity damage, which they can stack with other damage writing abilities as well. But enough of all this. Let's just get right into it, shall we? Spore Druids those who find beauty and decay in all cycles of life. Death isn't the end of life, but instead a change of state that sees new life be born from it. Though, don't get it twisted. While these druids see nothing inherently wrong with undeath, they will put an end to them, should they disrupt the cycle. And as such, many of the spore druids' abilities are intended to be temporary. These druids are surrounded by invisible necrotic spores, which they can unleash upon their foes to deal necrotic damage. They can also harness those spores to create a symbiotic entity, increasing their health and allowing them to deal extra necrotic damage with each of their attacks. While this entity is active, their Halo Spores ability will also be able to strike twice on the same target. And moreover, they can also infest corpses to create fungal zombies that have low hit points but function identically to the normal zombies you can summon. And we'll go over that in a bit later. And eventually, at level 10, they can hurl their spores into a noxious cloud, which will deal their halo of spores damage anytime a creature begins their turn in it, similarly to Hunger of Adar from Warlocks. One thing that people forget while playing a spore druid is that you're still a druid at the end of the day. While your symbiotic entity does use the same feature as your wild shape forms, you can still wild shape in lieu of the symbiotic entity, or you can use both together. And do not forget that druids have some of the most powerful concentration spells available in the game. One of my favorite spells is Moonbeam, which is a small AoE which is basically the full concentration of the moon, shooting a laser beam down, that you can move at the beginning of each of your turns. While it might not be the best damage in the game, it's still pretty solid, and the fact that you can keep moving it each turn, it makes it even better. That being said, there are plenty of other really great concentration spells only available to druids as well, and we'll get into that in a moment. Spore druids are a very interesting class to play, and can create plenty of minions to swarm your enemies. They can fulfill a variety of roles in your party, be it a solid support caster with spells like fairy fire and plenty of heals to boot. They can also be a decent frontliner, although their melee attacks would be limited to shillelagh shenanigans, unless you invest in Monk or another martial class. And their symbiotic entity necrotic damage will also apply to ranged attacks such as the dual wield crossbow. And their kit and spells can make them a solid ranged blaster character as well. With their fungal zombies and animate dead, they can have up to 5 fungal zombies and 3 animate dead minions. And they can summon a dryad with conjure woodland being, who in turn will summon a Woodwode. And druids can also conjure elementals on top of that. So all in all, a spore druid can summon about 12 to 14 minions, eight of those being undead. And that's not even talking about the Necromancy of Fate book. All right, before we move on to the tips for each act, let's get into the stats. As for starting stats for your spore druid, there are a few options to take. Since we can wear medium armor as druids, something to consider that most medium armors will cap out at getting, receiving a plus 2 bonus from your dexterity, so having a 14 dexterity is pretty solid. That being said, there are plenty of medium armors that have an uncapped dexterity, so having more dexterity is always nice to have. Although one of the main stats that the spore druid desires is having a highest wisdom possible. This will help your spell DCs and also increase the amount of fungal infestations you can have. As I believe it's one plus whatever your wisdom modifier is. The other really important stat, since we have a lot of really good concentration spells and we also like to have a lot of health, is obviously constitution. 
So it's up to you whether you decide if you want to have more dexterity, wisdom, or constitution. Strength can be a dumped stat, but I usually try to advise having at least a 10 in strength because if this is your main character, you're going to be carrying a lot of crap. At least I know I do. I'm a big loot hoarder in this game. That being said, a solid spread that will get you through most of the game would be 8 strength, 14 dexterity, 16 constitution, 8 intelligence, and 16 or 17 wisdom, and 10 charisma. If you decide to go to 17 wisdom, you can pick up Auntie Ethel's hair to bump you up to 18. And thus, after that, you can pick up an ASI to bump you up to 20. That is, of course, if you decide not to pick up the Warcaster feat, which is a really incredible feat for us. As I mentioned many times before in the video, that druids are very great concentration casters. So you may want to invest in that. If you decide you want to be a little bit more dexterity oriented, bump your dexterity up to 16, and perhaps you might be using some dual wield crossbows in the early game. But I should mention that the best armor in the game for Spora Druids in Act 3 is a light armor piece, thus it has an uncapped dexterity. So that's always something to consider in that aspect as well. But I'll get into why that armor is so good once we get to our Act 3 portion of the chapter. So now that we have kind of an idea of our stats, we can go to the races, but honestly the race doesn't really matter in the slightest. Yeah, there are some perks that some races can get versus others, but overall it's not going to be that much different between each other. So ultimately pick what you'd like. This build can work for Jahera, it can work for Halsen, and it can work for your main character if you want. It's all up to you. That being said, I do want to point out that there are no Spore Druid unique dialogues in the entire game. Unless I happen to miss it, there is nothing for the Spore Druids specifically. You would think the Spore Village down in the Underdark would have had something. Nope. What a disappointment. Alright, speaking of disappointments, no I'm just kidding. Alright, speaking of Act 1 type things, let's get into Act 1. How do we play the Spore Druid in Act 1? Well, essentially the druid can be a bit of a jack of all trades, so to speak, like a hybrid character. They can be on the front line if you need them to be. They could be a ranged character. They could be a spellcaster. But um, typically, I usually like to play mine kind of like a semi frontliner. I'll have them with the staff and shield, or maybe even a club. There are plenty of good staves and clubs in the early game, but there's also some other items that might be interesting too for your spar druid. Alternatively, you can use dual wield crossbows and you'll be functioning just fine if you have enough dexterity. Especially in combination with your symbiotic entity, you'll be doing extra necrotic damage with each strike. And one of the spells you can unlock at level 3 druid is Flame Blade, one of my favorite spells to pick, as it will just create a magical sword that will just deal fire damage per hit. 3 to 18 damage is not anything to scoff at at that low level. And keep in mind, you can wear medium armor, so you can get pretty tanky in Act 1. Especially if you decide to use the Grimforge items for your character. I believe you can get up to at least 22 AC if you plan accordingly. Just bridge is nothing to scoff out that early in the game. And of course, I won't stop talking about Moonbeam. One of my favorite spells, just be careful after combat as uh, sometimes you might end up running into your own beam by being too loot crazy. So just be careful with that. Uh, sometimes if you feel like you're not going to be using your Moonbeam anymore, you can just go down to the bottom and unclick or click off of whatever concentration spell you have. In this case, Moonbeam. And uh, yeah, that's that. So pretty much you'll just be kind of being this mid-range character, kind of bouncing on the front line, casting a few spells here and there, up until level 6. That's when things really start changing for the Spore Druid. We have access to our Fungal Zombies. This is when things start taking a turn for the Spore Druid as you'll kind of be pivoting your strategy towards helping your zombies secure the kills on anything that has clawing knock. Of course, you can also get the kill too. It doesn't have to be the zombie. As long as that disease is on them, you're good to go. Just be careful not to hit any of the corpses with spells that might destroy the corpse, such as fire, acid, radiant, necrotic, or electricity, I believe. Once you hit level 7, that's when things really start to pop off for your spore druid. You'll be able to upcast your anime dead spell, giving you up to three entities, whether it's a skeleton or the zombies, and then you'll have all your fungal zombies on top of that. So you can mix and match your little undead army to have a bit of ranged firepower with the skeleton marchers, or you can just fully invest in your zombies. 
and just overwhelm your enemies. One of my favorite images in the game is when the Githyanki turn on you in the crash and you kind of just pour out of their main chamber with a big flood of zombies. I think in that fight I ended up pulling the entire crash at this one time, at least the most I could, and I'm pretty sure I, at the height of it I had at least 15 zombies, I want to say, until they all, they all died because the Githyanki had a bunch of AoE, but that's neither here nor there. There are plenty of times where you will be snowballing with your Spore Druid, or any Necromancer really, but the Spore Druid especially just because you have just those few extra zombie hands from your fungal zombies. The only downside though with the Spore Druid is once you start getting into your stride of things, sadly most of the enemies you'll be fighting are undead themselves, such as the Shades and whatnot from Act 2. Which can be annoying, but your zombies still do full damage, but they just won't be able to make new zombies. Although most of the enemies in Act 2 are resistant or just flat out immune to necrotic damage, which kind of negates your archers, for the most part. I'd probably say about half the enemies in Act 2 make your Spore Druid kind of annoyed. But hey, all those creatures that are resistant or immune to necrotic are most likely vulnerable to Radiant. Thus, your Moonbeam will truly shine. And honestly, Act 2, the Spore Druid doesn't really have that much of an issue. It's still a Druid at the end of the day, which has access to plenty of great spells. I'll even use Wall of Fire in Act 2 in some of the fights, especially with that dumb kid who's trying to play hide and seek with you. That just a, wall, a perfectly placed Wall of Fire will negate the entire fight. And that being said, I think Spore Druid is probably one of the only few classes that can actually solo Moonrise Towers, as you'll see here with our Zombie Stampede. There was a little bit of cheese to set this up, <laughs> and no pun intended, it actually involved lots of mice. So there is a hidden boss in the Shard Temple. When you attack a few of the rats, they'll all scramble and go hide behind some weird statue thing. And when you go down there, you'll just be swarmed by waves and waves of rats. Well, as you can see in this little montage right behind us, it ended up becoming rats versus zombies. And I had way too many zombies to count at the end of it, and I just <laughs> and I just used the waypoint to get to Moonrise and just kind of steamrolled over with all these zombies. Granted, this is only, this is not only unique to Spore Druids. Any necromancer with a zombie can do this, but I just think it feels real suiting. Since you can have the most zombies as a spore druid. Okay, so now that we're done with Act 2, we're finally moving into Act 3 when we can get access to the greatest spore druid chess piece in the game. So the armor is called Armor of the Spore Keeper, which can be found from a certain mummy in the lower city. I'll mark it here. So, and you can just buy this from him. So what this does is when you have your symbiotic entity active, you'll be granted three new fungal abilities. Bipper Bing Spores, Tinmus Spores, and Haste Spores, which makes your Spore Druid have a plenty of new versatile options. Bipper Bing Spores are an AoE explosion, more or less, which will create a cloud of noxious fumes. And what noxious fume does is it'll deal one to four poison damage per turn, and creatures must succeed a constitution saving throw or take an additional 2d4 poison damage. Timus Spores has a chance to make your enemies be befuddled, uh, which means that an affected entity can't control its actions and wanders around without direction. Talk about awesome CC. And then of course, Haste. Who doesn't love Haste? How about the ability to throw Haste Spores on the ground and any of your allies can walk on it, and it will last more than just one turn, and they'll be granted Haste. It's freaking awesome, honestly. All of this while you have Symbiotic Entity active, while wearing this armor. These can each only be used once per long rest, so use them wisely. And honestly, this should have been available to you throughout the rest of the game, but you know, it is what it is. Enjoy it now that you have it. Now that you have these new ways to interact with your different Spore abilities, this is when the Spore Druid can really have some fun. If you weren't already having fun now anyways. Not to mention that once you get to Act 3, you start getting to the higher levels. You also get spells to like Contagion, which I think is underrated. It's a pretty solid ability, especially that fact that you always have it uh, available to you. You don't have to prepare it or anything special like that. It's always known. And there's different things you can apply to people, such as vulnerability to all damage. Or just make it, uh, enemies before. Granted, yes, I know. You could use the Illithid power to do the same thing. Like, come on, who wants to put a little tadpole in their brain? Screw that. We're embracing undeath here, not some weird squid-faced freaks. 
And so we also get some other great spells too, like Cloud Kill, probably one of the best concentration spells in the game. And the best part of it is that your undead are completely immune to poison. So you can just slap, slap this on the battlefield somewhere and let your undead swarm the battlefield in the blanket of poison. All that being said, the Spore Druid is probably the most versatile necromancer available to us to play. So like I said, the Spore Druid is a very versatile character. I like to play it more of a mid-ranger. Being able to kind of go up on the front in the front lines if they need to, or hang back and cast little spells. Maybe cast some support spells here with healing word or some other healing abilities, or just even buffs too. Not to mention you can be a very powerful blaster in your own right with some plenty of really powerful concentration spells that you can keep moving or recasting every turn for free, which helps keeps your uh, longevity for your spell slots, which is fantastic. Or you can also just really dive into the extra damage you get from necrotic damage from your weapons which will tie us into the multi-class options for this class. Let's talk about multi-classes with the Spore Druid. You, yes, it's true, they usually prefer to be as pure as possible to get even higher symbiotic entity health, but they also get that pretty sweet 10th level feature, although you're not missing too much if you end up multi-classing before that. One of my favorite ways to multi-class the Spore Druid is to dip into Fighter, like in my Jahara build, which you can combine either 5 levels of Fighter or 5 levels of Ranger. Both of them have their pros and cons. Fighter gets Action Surge, while Ranger will get you more spell slots and gives you 100 mark, so really stack on that additive damage for your weapon attacks. But what they both have is a fighting style and the ability to have extra attack to help again take advantage of your necrotic attacks. From your weapons. Another pretty sweet option is to combine monks. However, the monk has the same issue as the spore druid is that they want to be as pure as possible and there aren't really many ways to gain key back in between fights other than short rests. There is one item that will give you some key but once you're out of that key you're gonna be out of your little combo points from your flurry of bows for example. That being said you probably could do six levels of monk and six levels of spore druid if you so desire but I personally think that the better 6-6 six, six split would be between the 6 levels of the Spore Druid and 6 levels of Necromancer Wizard. Since you'll have access to all your spell slots you normally would, but there is a little bit of cheese tactics you can do in Baldur's Gate 3 with the Wizard that you can scribe spells beyond what you're able to actually cast through the Wizard. So you'll be able to cast 6 level spells with the 6-6 six, six split, but you can still cast actual 6 level spells if you scribe them, should you find the scrolls to do so. Something to consider. So all in all, multi-class options, you got your fighter or ranger and do a little split with that. Or you can do the monk as well. But the strongest option is probably the 6-6 six, six split with necromancer wizard and the spore druid. You'll have very strong minions, you'll have access to 6 level wizard spells, all your druid spells, you name it. You'll have to kind of work out what sp uh, specific spells you want to run and then and have your stats allocated accordingly. So as for the leveling guide for the 6 necromancer, 6 spore druid, I would highly recommend leveling up as a druid first and then switching over to the wizard druid hybrid later. Because I feel like in the early game, the druid is a much, much stronger class than the wizard, and you'll have a much better time with that. So keep playing your druid until you hit level six, and then around level seven is when you may consider switching over to the wizard druid hybrid. In which case, make sure when you do respect to have your multi-class, make sure you start off with the wizard as this will make your primary casting ability your intelligence, which will be very important later. And as such, make sure your intelligence is as high as it can be. I like to go 16. You can do 17 if you decide to do the anti-ethyl cheese. Honestly, that's probably the best way to go. But I like to have a little bit of wisdom. You probably don't need that. You know what? Let's just do how most people probably be playing it. So we'll have 17, in 17 intellect, 10 wisdom, 16 constitution, 14 dexterity, and we dump strength and charisma. So this uh, spell combination might actually be better for, you know, Halson or even Gale or whatever other character you want instead of your main character. As for your cantrips, uh, Firebolt's decent, Ray of Frost is decent. We're going to be getting Bone Chill 
through our druid anyways, so you don't need to grab that right now. Actually, just in case it messes with the spell casting, let's go ahead and grab Bone Chill now. And then let's get Shocking Grass for people that are up close in our face that we don't want to be. As for your spells, make sure you want to pick up Magic Missile and Shield. Everything else doesn't really matter too much. You can pick, it's all dealer's choice, but hands down, Shield is probably one of the best spells in the game. And Magic Missile I like to have just for the guaranteed hits and whatnot. Everything else is some subjective and you can choose as you desire. But there will be a lot of overlap through our druid spells too. So trying to pick towards um, damaging spells or wizard only spells as the druid spells can typically cover our utility and all that jazz. And then you can go keep going into wizard. But I am going to switch over to druid at this point because I'm going to be leveling this up as if you are level 7 and are trying to start this multi-class. As for your cantrips, shillelagh is always pretty solid. Um, thorn whips, whatever, it's decent. It can be fun to yank people around, but uh, I feel like its distance isn't long enough to really make use. Of, uh, make use. If it was a lot longer of a distance, then thorn whip would probably be pretty solid for yanking people around. But you can never go wrong with guidance. By you having guidance, you do not need to have a cleric around or shadowheart, unless you know you're a fan of her for some reason. As for your spells from your druid. Unless you're playing as Halson, uh, you'll want to grab Healing Word, because Halson always has Healing Word learned no matter what class or whatever he is. But Healing Word's a really solid spell to have, as it uh, is bonus action heal that you can use for emergencies to bring people back up. Alright, then obviously at level 2, we'll pick up Spore Druid. Uh, then I guess all these other spells don't really matter that much, because since they're prepared spells, so you can change them on, as you wish on the fly in between combat. So don't worry about it too much, but if you are curious what spells you might want to run, uh, Goodberry is always nice to have. But again, you can change things on the fly, so pick whatever you want at the, that you need at the time. I usually will run uh, Thunder Wave or Healing Word, but if our main stat is going to be Intellect, we'll probably want that through the Wizard. So let's just grab some of our utility spells, like Speak with Animals, for example. And we'll keep increasing. Now we've got access to our level 2 spells. And we got a feat. So we can pick up Warcaster. It's one of my favorite feats as this combination since we're going to have really powerful concentration spells. And you can pick whatever ability you want. Let's go with Poison Spray. Why not? Let's fix up our prepared spells. Don't want any of that stuff. Call Lightning's pretty decent. Flame Blade's pretty neat. Moonbeam's always nice. Change it as you wish. And now we're level 6. Now we get access to our Fungal Infestation. And then we can return back to Wizard. Oops. Back to Wizard. Obviously, make sure you pick up Necromancy so we can get our buffed up minions and Grim Harvest. And your Necromancy Savant so you can uh, scribe all those spells much easier. Uh, pick whatever spells you want. I'm just picking weird stuff. Don't mind me. I'll let you know when there's a spell that you want to have. Such as Misty Sep, this is a very great spell to have. Um, Halston always has it available, so if you're not playing as Halston, make sure you pick up Misty Step. Uh, I like to pick up Invisibility because it's good in combat and out of combat. Pretty solid spell. Uh, let's pick up Friends. Some more new spells, let's do Blur and Knock. Feats, let's just pump up our Intelligence. So obviously if you did the anti ethel you can get that to 20 and then you can use the mirror in act 3 to get that to 22. Lower your charisma or strength, whatever you desire. If this is your main character, you probably don't want to get rid of strength since you'll be carrying a lot of stuff, but that's me. Alright, that's our spells. So, as you saw earlier, I had a lot of spells learned that I didn't pick up. Um, that was from scribing them earlier. I was trying to record earlier, but I, I forgot to hit record, so sadly, I, you didn't get to see that. But um, as you can see, I pick up scrolls for Cloud Kill, Chain Lightning, all this other stuff. So I can cast these abilities, and it will use our intellect, since our main spellcasting stat is intellect, since we chose Wizard first at level 1. And you also have your empowered animate dead minions, although they won't have as much health as you if you were a... Necromancer Wizard, but that's not a big deal. At least in my opinion. So that's the leveling build, and uh, I would showcase uh, some items and such, but I feel like this video is long enough as it is. 
I could go on and on about all the ways to play the Spore Druid, and I think I've already rambled enough as it is. So I think I will end this chapter here. I hope you found this chapter of the Necronomicon very useful and help you get a little more enjoyment out of your Spore Druids. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more guides like this. And I hope to see you in the next chapter of the Necronomicon or in one of my other guides as well. Thank you so much for watching and farewell for now.